Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, or wherever you might be in the world. Here we are, uh, and we are going to kick and go straight into this to Michael, three posters, Oborn, who is celebrating the 10th anniversary of Mission Planner, which, uh, if you don't know, if you don't know what Mission Planner is, you're not really from this industry. You cannot be from this industry. Uh, it was, I can't, I, I was trying hard to remember before we started what, what we had before Mission Planet, and that was just nothing, wasn't it, I think, Michael? Uh, I think there was actually a lab view GCS, but um, let's just say it was quite complicated and required a fair bit of setup. So was, Mission Planet was definitely, uh, the very first incarnation was definitely a, a lot easier than that. So, <laughs> so what made you decide to create Mission Planet in, I don't know, in drone years, probably about 100 drone years ago? Yeah, um, I think, I think like everything, there was a need for it at the time. And I don't know my background in IT and also love flying model planes. So I was, I was a model flyer way before I even started Mission Planet. So planes, helis, that sort of thing. So it's it's sort of you bring the heli and the plane together with control software and it kind of just oh, meets together very nicely in the middle, if you know what I mean. So yeah, it's it's been a ride, that's for sure. And what do you think? Well, how how's it gone? Has it has it all panned out how you thought it would? Has it where's it taken you to? Um yeah, that's that's a good one. It's certainly been a very interesting ride. Um like back in the days, like I started back in the APM days, they were just transitioning from the RDIMU, the single board with the 80 mega 328, to the actual, what we know as the oil pan boards now, with the dual stack boards with the 2560. And yeah, definitely things have changed since then. Like no MavLink back then, it was just the very start of MavLink. Um, it's crazy how many things have changed just and it's still changing today, like going from very minimal IMU based from the thermopile solution to the IMU solution to full telemetry radios. And now, of course, we're getting into video, FPV video, low latency video, uh, ADSB, like the, the list just keeps on going, if you get what I mean by that. So it's quite a big change from back then. <laughs> from back then. Does anyone else want to jump in? I thought Ian would be jumping with the questions here, but he's looking for his T-shirt. <laughs> he's going to he's going to find his mic. Look, Mr. Captain Technology. Even though he's got a spangly hat, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd catch you out there. <laughs> he's made himself overcomplicated. Nothing's working. Yeah. He has. He has. I love that. I love that. And he's failed to put his posters up. He's absolutely terrible. He tells us his posters off to the right. I can't. I've got a poster as well. It's in the in the tube over there. But I've got to sort them out. So, where where? So I know. I, I know one thing that has happened. Damn which, you! I'm I, fixed. Ah. <laughs> I have just as we started. I have downloaded and run from the Play Store the Android version yeah. of Mission Planner. What's that all about? Okay, so probably about, I would have said two, maybe three months ago, I released a beta version of Mission Planner for Android, available on the Google Play Store. Um, need to go searching for it. And you'll find it is an, pretty much an exact copy of Mission Planner for Windows. Um, pretty much all the exact same features are there. Uh, there are a couple of caveats, um, obviously some Windows things don't port to Android natively. So there are a few things that don't work as intended and that's hence why it's still beta. So still tidying up, but in terms of connecting to a drone, uh, controlling it, planning a mission, ADSB, all of that stuff works. Uh, RTK, um, you can connect via RTK, do flight missions. Like I know I tested uh, RTK on that drone just there, just the other day using the Android version. So it all works um, pretty much as you'd expect it to, the same as the Windows version would work. So um, yeah, it's been a long time coming. I'm sure everyone that knows <laughs> knows that uh, it's needed to happen. So, um, but yeah, it's definitely fine tuning it a bit more, um, making it a bit more reliable on Android and just targeting 
uh, things and obviously getting video working is a very high priority as well. Video is working in it now, but not as you'd see in normal Windows desktop mission planner. So, Are they, I mean, how many people's Android phones and tablets would be pound full enough to get everything, things like that running as well? And how will you get that video signal into your Android tablet or phone? Um, really depends on you're using. Like in my test scenario, I've been using Healink, so it's all uh, IP already. So it's very easy to get it in there. If you're using something more traditional, um, like as an example, I wouldn't really suggest it for FPV in the first place. You're probably getting latency all over the place. Um, but for inspection and stuff like that, like applications where the Healink is applicable, um, it actually works pretty good. But yeah, it really depends on your your source and what you're doing out in the field, that sort of thing. So, well, if it's IP video as well, we're going to be talking um, Open HD. You're going to be talking all of those other systems that are, are all you know. It's the way those systems are going now. There's one by um, I'm trying to remember the name. I, I actually had the system to try as well. Um, Skylink, I think it is. So there's a few IP systems on the market alongside Healink. So there are a lot of options. It's going to be really yeah. Important. IP is definitely going. I'd say IP is where the future is going in this industry in general. Um, just as things get more complicated, like you can you can put it you can tie it in similar to cars. Like back in the day, cars were CAN bus, which is where we're at now. Cars are now starting to go IP, and guess what? That's where we're going to be next as well. So, so we're going to have a bit of a jump through. Are we going to skip through CAN then? Little little tiny jump through CAN and on to the next thing. I think CAN will still win in general, mainly because of the topology. Like um, CAN is basically you can spread out everywhere, whereas IP is more central node, like hub based. So I, I think CAN is not going to disappear anytime soon, but I think Ethernet will start to certainly take its place as well. I think they offer two different areas. You know, if we look at CAN, it, it works really well for sensors, doesn't it? Yeah. And it allows a lot easier integration with the daisy yep. chaining but not only that you're finally dumping i2c which is just yeah. horrible you know in this environment okay it's amazing we've got as far as we have with it but it's not the ideal solution and whereas ip is the next natural layer for the communication because obviously it's digital communication it, all of these devices are communicated virtually that way anyway aren't they mm. um, just my device on... my device is just use smoke signals <laughs> Absolutely, it's as long as, it works. So as long as exactly as long as it works. Woody FBV in the comments is uh, talking about um, large BV loss programs, places like North Dakota, and then I think we get to the nub of his questioning really, and what kind of impact commercial automated flight will have on the hobby community. I'll get a simple answer for you there, Woody. There will be no hobby community. But anyway, we'll come back to that later. Yeah. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Basically, it kills hobby community. But that aside, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, enjoying that. <laughs> yeah, no, we will definitely be rooting back round towards that later. But the hobby community is in fact rich is here to talk to us about something that's happening in uh, in the uk around the hobby stuff uh, we'll come to that again in a minute we haven't finished with michael yet where do you see where hey, do you see mission planners be, before, other... Go on. before richard no before richard comes up isn't it the time of the year to get a new gatwick uh, scandal it's about the Ooh, time uh, uh, right time but uh, uh, not not but with, well, with the uk lockdown it it's not very 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 impactful right it's harder have, so yeah it may, i haven't to been difference. able to get out yet that's the problem i'm trying i'm trying but it's just been raining and i know that didn't stop me last time ian. But still. <laughs> come on ian now now you are confined to to your shed you cannot even leave your shed from what we, we hear on the news I'm not allowed to leave my shed, and that's just my wife. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, that's a different thing altogether. But anyway, I was going to—I was going to ask Michael. He's got up very early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, folks. Um, where do you where do you see 
how shall not not just say the word mission plan but ground control stations going where where are we traveling with ground control stations you've you've come from come along in 10 years what's going to be like in 10 years time um that's 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 a good question um i think uh, obviously a lot more 3d um i think is going to be a lot of a lot of thing um i will say like 3D is definitely one of those tricky ones. Um, like given the current rules, like visual line of sight, all this other stuff, obviously beyond visual line of sight is where 3D probably really plays in. But with, while you're still playing in visual line of sight realms, 3D doesn't really give you anything, if you get what I mean by that. So um, obviously 3D, uh, video, very video I think is definitely, um, as we get uh, higher bandwidth links, further distance, um, video definitely plays a big part of that. Um, and yeah, and I, if dare I say it, regulatory uh, stuff is definitely one of the big ones, I think. It doesn't matter which country in the world you're in, regulatory is definitely, whether it be India, like their NPAM or whatever the name of their system is, and a few other ones as well. So. Yeah, I think it's just going to get more regulatory a lot over the next coming years versus it's the fun stuff, if you get what I mean. I, it's think, funny with I think Gary would... No, I think Gary would like to have a, a ground control station to be just like Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. So yeah. something like yeah. uh, visual impactful... Absolutely, and the well, the whole idea of a synthetic sky uh, that that you you operate at, yeah. I mean, what I would love to have is to take your three hundred and sixty camera there, Louis, dump it on top of my car when I'm operating, and bring that picture feed into my uh, ground control station, so that I can then overlay overlay the traffic and in, into screens that are ground, or even a VR headset. And that was that was a, a big big dream in the air traffic world when I was in it years ago. That we'd all stand, we'd all be stood in a dome and overseeing everything all around us and be able to to tap on tracks and drag them around <laughs> bang 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 all that sort of a thing um and, and and that that was the vision then but i think i think we're getting there anyway sorry i'm ranting <laughs> back to you michael i, I was i was just going to i was just going to say on on mission plan I, i've sort of always had a, a love hate relationship with mission planner stroke Ardra pilot and i always blame mission planner for the problems of Ardra pilot because it's shoot the messenger to be honest if you get my drift at times because it is very much the messenger with ten thousand prams that i'm trying to find the one i actually need however the one thing i always surprised me not that how many come see. on ian <laughs> okay nine thousand and ninety eight um yeah we've told you a million times don't exaggerate but it's how many often you see mission planner in places you wouldn't expect to see it you know i don't know if you know how many times it's been downloaded michael i don't know if you have any stats or stuff like that but you, you know if anyone who follows the groups the ardra pilot groups there's always a military and i know it's not designed for that but there's someone doing testing and they, you look in the background and there's an image of a ground station and it's always mission planner it's always there it just shows how it is <laughs> it is if what no it's not mission planner it's our special proprietary yeah. software that we've invested <laughs> millions of hours in time with our own aircraft and our own code and everything we've done yeah, ourselves yeah, come on, Mr. Guys. We, we all know that the the, the source code of mission planner is freely available so uh, and the license allows that so guys can take it up and and do whatever they want to um granted that they're not complying fully with the licensing so they're not uh, returning the what they developed back to mission planner would be nice to have some of those developments put back to the main code but uh, Michael knows best, uh, and sometimes we see, we really see uh, crazy things do, done on top of Mission Planner. Yeah, it's it's got to give you a smile to see it every now. And just how far and wide it's ended up, Michael, over the yeah, years. I, I must admit, I see it in some places that I certainly don't expect as well. Um, like I don't I don't see a lot of exposure, but every now and then you see this thing and think. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I certainly wasn't expecting it there. So um, it certainly made it out. Like, like I do, I do have some stats, and I think we're around fifty thousand uh, different users a month. Um, and so, like, there's definitely, there's definitely being used out there 
Um, but and like that doesn't even include half the modified versions. So yeah. yeah. Hmm. So when you say Michael, fifty thousand, can, can you can you tell tell uh, can you tell people how uh, if Mission Planner has changed your life? It started uh, as a hobby, right? Yes, I I was until two years ago. I was still had a full time job, so uh, working IT. So yeah, but now thanks to Philip, uh, part of Q Pilot now, and yeah, so now I do this full time. Hence why the Android version went do or shut off all of a sudden. Um, it just like everything, it's time and effort, and uh, having more time certainly makes things a lot easier. Don't say nice things. So it, it's a, a, a <laughs> note for a note for summary and holiday. Don't say nice things. About yeah, it. holiday in Tasmania. Some of us can dream. He's <laughs> he's he's a man about town down there. He's he's probably not watching this, is he? Because it's early in the morning. No. Um, no. Yeah, no. It's um, internet access. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's I think that's it. Tom, check your inbox; it's there. And uh, back to the comments. Woody saying he's uh, uh, well. Let's put the comment up. He's saying that he's actually lives in the proposed area. Ref reference was approached by someone who works with the air engineering firms. Now, be working the possible position. I wouldn't be torn. You can you can you can save the hobby, Woody. You can you can keep saving the top hobby. We need people on the inside. That's what we need. People on the inside. Hang on, he's put another coming up. Let's go that. Uh, to end the hobby, mm, yeah, yeah, I don't know. What do we say to that, people? Does someone else want to pick that comment up before I do? We're using tech developer hobby by about pioneers to end the hobby. Well, the whole the it's whole. a natural thing. Uh, you you just climb on on top of what someone else has developed, uh, be it uh, a, a novice or a, a professional user. Uh, look at what Michael has done and what people are have been doing on top of Mission Planner. And on the shoulders you of just giants. evolve on top of. Uh, no, uh, I, I've met Michael. He's not that giant. He's about the same height as I am, and I'm not a giant. <laughs> there will be giants. Here we go. Look out. It, it, is, it, it is astounding that something yes. that began 10 years ago, if you look at what people put out now in press releases, and you see in the background it's Mission Planner, you just go... It just yeah. makes you smile, yeah. doesn't Absolutely. it? You know, all this yeah. groundbreaking stuff, and you just see in the background, yeah, yeah. mission oh. planner, and you just go, you, you, you instantly know there's Ardu pilot in the aircraft. You know, mission planner's running it all. It says so much for the work you guys do. It is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, thank you so much. Yeah. You know, for thank someone you. that uses your kit and stuff, just thank you because yeah. you've made it easy, and it yeah. is. It's just so easy to use. Once once you've played with it for a bit, Mission Planner becomes very good. You know what I mean? It's easy to find your way around. It makes sense. Yeah. I mean, sometimes the tree stuff can get a bit, you know, your brain's just going, oh. But no, thank you so much, Michael. It's, yeah. Your problem is, Mark, you haven't spent the time learning <laughs> all of the prams, right? But that's the problem. Once you learn all of the prams, it's fine. But no, another thing, actually, one of the, the revolutionary parts of Mission Planner is Control-F. When you find Control-F, it changes your life. For those who don't know about it, try it. It, it really does change your life. Is that is okay, that Captain? So we, we are safe. We are safe because uh, Ian has only found out about Control-F. He hasn't found out about the other hidden shortcuts. Yes. So uh, we are safe. Go. It's like a lot Go. easier. Although Go. another revolutionary thing was uh, F5 to refresh the parameters. No, no, no. no, no. The one, uh, uh, and something, uh, and something that I have to say, something that I have to say about Michael, uh, some time ago, about two years ago, I've asked Michael to do uh, a way to come up with a way that we would have a list of parameters that would be the most frequently changed. So we would have a, a pre-selection of parameters. So Ian, if you have a couple of parameters and you can get them uh, right in front of you, 
So that's usability for you. A checklist, yeah. I, I use that all the time. All the time. Yeah. To be fair, fact, it is a funny thing. Yeah, is, there's, there's, like, there's, there's a few different ways. Project. You can pin you can pin them in the full parameter list to get them at the yeah, top, yeah. or you can use the user tab and just add whichever parameters you care about. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the big the big improvements is you know when we saw the compass improvements that that made a huge difference in that you know for those who were playing with the can early on there was some pain but once the new update it, it's so easy now it really I will is. say there's pain, probably going to be in that area as well just with the node IDs because at the yes. moment obviously we've targeted compasses at the moment but next on the list is going to be GPSs um, if you have more than one GPS on can at the moment it can be a bit of a interesting scenario so i know that's coming very soon so there'll probably be Tricky. screens like that as well, well it, the, the, the redundant part works it's just the um it it whatever everyone boots up is like the first one and so you can't use it very easily for the compass setting yeah. Ah, right. So it's swapping on. It can it can switch on boot. Is it? It's, it yeah, one so, is always one, and two isn't always two. It, it's decision on. Okay. Right. When, when you're on a can, you can't specify a certain one. So that that's been added. Uh, that's that's in progress right now. And is that on the canvas? So it's what it's doing is it's swapping the compasses around as well. Then is it? Right. So that, that's the thing is uh, on compasses that actually was uh, addressed uh, already. Compasses will follow. Um, GPS. Yeah, so I mean, it's they were they were done like that because you could have multiple on an, on an I2C bus. So whichever one booted up and talked first, they would swap. And so that was sort of addressed, but CAN's kind of a different problem, but similar. So it's same same similar problem, but uh, CAN has been fixed in that regard, but not for CAN wise. Can can I, can I put a request in? If we... Sure. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I have easier swarm control? Easier swarm programming. Yep. The, like I would say there are a few, a few already, but as soon as you type swarm, I'd say you're not in the easy field already if you get what I mean by that. So that's it. Can we also add easy AI? <laughs> yeah. And machine vision and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Michael, just looking forward, I just wanted to piggyback one of Gary's comments. I'm Richard, by the way. Um, good to meet you. Uh, looking forward into you know, the next 10 years, but not even that far, if we're looking into UTM and you take the FAA CONOPS piece where in the middle of their diagram, you've got a UAS service supplier. Yep. What does your platform do in feeding information into maybe that UAS service supplier in the future? And, and how do you see that kind of working? And also, what, what do you think the regulator is going to be look, looking for from you guys in terms of setting the standard or or where you think it might go to enhance a a you know a good safety case for example um i think that depends a lot on what drone id and what component is required to report back are we talking the drone has to report back or are we talking the gcs has to be in contact with the drone and then the gcs reports back so it depends on the way that works like Obviously, for in terms of authorization to fly and stuff like that, the GCS can be involved because it can be the middleman. Um, yeah. Basically, I want to fly this area. Can I fly this area? It goes back, sends to the drone. You're allowed to fly this area. Um, yeah. But in terms of like drone ID, like where it is at any one point in the sky, I don't know what the regulations are going to say. Is it going to say it has to be attached to the drone because that's where this device is, or is it going to be? able to be proxied through the ground control station to the, this cloud UTM provider yeah. so like I can't I can't answer the quick like the bottom line is is I can integrate whatever but okay I need more information as to how or what is going to happen in the first place like yeah. all the ones I've seen uh, on drone already if you get what I mean by that like whether it be cell based or whatever um, like in terms of authorization to fly that I typically see that as GCS space, but in terms of actually active management in the air, I don't know who or what or like as an example, if there was two drones in a UTM environment, they're flying towards each other. Um, who's who's stopping? Who's avoiding? Etc. So in reality, the GCS could be involved in that in terms of proxying those commands, as in you need to go left, you need to go right, but. Yeah. In reality, it's probably going to be talking straight to the drone, as in you need to avoid something. So, um, like, mi mission planner sends it a mission, I want to do this sort of thing. But ultimately, 
who's responsible for like this it's a it's a double-edged sword honestly because should something happen like the drone has to move out of the way hits a tree hits a power line like there is there are that many things that could happen a, a bird i don't know and yeah. takes out the drone in the same place so like it's i don't know <laughs> i don't yeah, know I mean, if yet. it's it's a really interesting one and it, you know it's open for a lot of discussion and development but i think you know if we look at the latest uh, regulations in in the uk not only do they want to know where the drone is located, but they want to know where the pilot is located, which probably, you know, predominantly the pilot will have the GCS with them, right? For, for the, for the right. That, that, that's the big thing about the drone ID. So, so ultimately, you've got to know both the location. It's not coming from your point of view there, where you're describing about, you know, sense and avoid or detect and avoid. This is purely about if you fly out of an airspace or above an airspace, can the regulator catch you? And, and does that then in the future lead to an automatic fine? Uh, you know, it's good. I think you know, some of that data that you get from your platform, I think will be interesting in terms of how that's interrogated in the future. How are you going to protect that data? How, how you know, and I think, you know, some pilots are really going to be quite conscious about that because of over-regulation. And I think that's going to be, you know, something for you guys to consider. Yeah, well, obviously, we will have to comply with whatever the rules yes. are set. So, in yeah. reality, there is no choice. Dare well, I it's say. complicated because it's worldwide. I mean, I mean, there's potentially different rules for different parts of the world. Yeah. 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 I, I don't, so, I don't that, that is the big problem with this. That That is the issue here because Europe uh, has one set of rules. The UK has a very similar set of rules, but they are splintering off now when we have the US proposal. And what isn't clear is, yes, the U, if you take the US proposal, the drone must not be able to take off by unless it's connected to the, uh, the US provider. Now, the question still remains, can that be through the ground station or does the aircraft have to transmit directly? You know, this information is already going from the aircraft to the ground station, but are they going to require the aircraft sends it directly or can it be passed through the ground station off? UK is much less restrictive in that element um as long as the ground station or the aircraft is transmitting they're happy and europe's very much the same but france has splintered off again you know france has got their drone id alongside the current rules that are coming in as well so it, it, it's all messy and unfortunately you guys are going to be left integrating five or six different systems yeah. and ways of doing it depending on where the user is i don't think it's going to stand here in the united states i think it'll get struck down I, I yeah, I, it has been watered, hasn't it, somewhat already compared to the NPRM. You know, the NPRM was insanity. So let's hope something, some less. Well, well, do, do you say, but, but Patrick, do you say that because some of the players that will be pushing for this are falling by their, their um, businesses are falling apart anyway? Or do you say it because there's pushback from the industry? Uh, both. I, I think, uh, you know, we have a worldwide, you know, I don't think. And I, you know, I've been beating this drum for a, a year or two. Um, what happens is you, you made a good point, Gary. So a lot of the people that are that the FAA uses as SMEs and, you know, in other countries, too, um, they don't even know. What, they, they have no idea what they're talking about. And then usually what happens, there's a cycle where these businesses fold up and you're left with this uh, legacy um, Show. <laughs> it's legacy bullshit. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, but that's what it is. So yeah, you get this. This. Uh, I mean, we we are okay. It's the same deal. These people are going for their TCs. You know, the guy at Amazon, Gers gone. Um, you know, three D robotics is basically as re blah blah blah. We have all of that. The other thing that we have over here in the United States, and I've, I've been complaining about this for some time, is the pr uh, private public uh, UTM, uh, or not UTM, public-private rulemaking. I got set off by the comment there. And, um, you know, it's this RID thing is a total ex parte, you know. The people that, that are helping them put the technology together to roll it out here, which we're running out of December, it's supposed to, the RID thing's supposed to come out. Uh, I mean, I've already heard from people. They're like, oh, yeah, well, I'm working with T-Mobile, and um, the RID is going to be free. It's going to be part of your, um, you know, data subscription plan for your SIM card. 
and they, you know, and I'm like, free? Uh, I, you know, there is, well, yeah, there's no free here in America. I don't know where. Data subscriptions, SIM card, just said it there, didn't it? It's, it's not, not free. free. You know, that's another thing. I want to, I want to really, you know, since it's Christmas, I wanted to do some like real Christmas sunshine. And I hope we have time for that because I got something in the sack right here for like everybody. Uh, Christmas sunshine but, from you? What? I, don't, you <laughs> what? But, uh, I just don't see this standing, man. I, you're going to, here in America, they're not, the government is not supposed to be able to tell you have to buy a product you know uh like i mean e even here ga and aviation it's not mandated that in, in every state that you have to have liability insurance you know most but, of the state, no. but this is kind of the, the, the you we could say to michael let's have a big 10-year plan big picture thinking 3d sky this that electronics and this this is amongst a group of people that could make that happen uh this is a group that could make that happen but if we're still flying 1950s Cessnas with 1950s technology and all the rest of it. We're, we're never going to have that sky. They've got to get out of the way. <laughs> oh, I better get off my high horse quick. But it's, it's, all it's, special. Uh, it's all special. Sorry? It's all special interest. And who can yeah. advocate for what? And that's what's wrong with this industry. And it came to uh, light to me, and everybody's like kind of wringing their hands, and I don't have any money, and there's no money for advocacy. That's just not true. Everyone is just trying to carve out their own little uh, fiefdom, and these fiefdoms uh, are left fighting it out in the FAA labs because they could sit back and do nothing for so many years. Or if somebody comes in and asks them, remember the big, remember when privacy was an issue? What was that, 2014? Oh, we're not going to be able to do anything with this uh, drone thing until we get privacy worked out. And then it just kind of went away. I don't think remote ID is going to be what they want it to be. My prediction is, is that the people at the FAA will roll out, hang out the shingle and start um, consulting on how to work through that and some of these other issues. But uh, I don't think it's going to stand here. I think it's going to get, uh, I think we have some big players here in the United States. They're quiet and they're starting to throw some money in the kitty. And I think they're going to go uh, after um, this remote ID thing. The other thing, well, you know, is that it's, they're going to start collecting all of this data. And then like, if you, you know, at one point you get, they, they find out you did something wrong or decide you did something wrong. then they're going to go back and, you know, through the history and supposedly uh, violate you for stuff you may have done in the past. Um, I don't, if it's not on all aircraft then forget it, you know, but I did see Patrick that um, the FAA, uh, when they put out the, a tender for all the companies to come to the table with respect to setting up UTM. I think there were seven, eight, there were seven or eight companies, some big players at the table. And one of the things that I looked at was, well, if we've got all these big players at the table, how are they going to look out, look out for the interests of other smaller companies or other interested parties? And the FAA mandated that they could only operate on the basis that it wasn't just for those people at the table. They had to respect and make provision for all these other companies. But, you know, we, we know really what's going to happen out of that uh, because it's those people, those companies writing the agenda from the get go, isn't it? Well, you know, we had a switch, you know, in, in uh, the days gone by. And I, I do, you know, because I don't know if you're on Twitter or whatever, but every once in a while I will post stuff. Do you remember, Gary, I had the, who was in control of the airspace integration thing when it was the DOD guys. I knew yeah. guys had it locked up, man. They were on RTCA, FAA, uh, uh, um, in the ARCs, on the uh, ASTM, yeah. giving money to Feinstein, giving money to, you know, these, these other people in the House Intel and uh, DOD or, or security. Um, you know, so now it's a bunch of smaller, uh, well, there's some smaller VC based companies. And then there's also some of the bigger companies like the uh, cell phone providers. Um, I think we're starting to see some problems, though. If you saw that uh, Aerox, that, that GE thing, they're, they're getting out of UTM. I think that there's some problems. The other thing with this RID, the promise that, you know, we're going to be able to fly beyond visual line of sight and over people. And a lot of people took the bait again and sold the uh, hobbyists out, threw them under the bus. Um, I don't see where RID is going to allow you to fly beyond visual line of sight without 
detect and avoid on board that's certified. And if you're going to let people fly uh, these over people without some sort of certification process, I think that's foolhardy too, because we all know that anything over 250 grams is, you know, lethal. So then just because you know where they are, you're going to let them fly over people. Um, I think that uh, that doesn't make any safety sense. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but that's the way I view it. Well, we've got to, we, we have to be very clear that we separate remote ID and electronic conspicuity because people are getting mighty confused out there now. People are getting confused about ADSB in in uh, DJI gear, they believe, and and in fact, in, in the cube, in the carrier board in the cube. People believe that ADSB in is what we're all talking about. People, uh, there, there's, there's all sorts of confusion out there, and it suits people for people to be confused, I think. Um, we've, we've seen it on the Gary that there's people asking how they disable the radio on the cube and you know Michael's seen the post you know I've responded to him you're going you it's in and they're going yeah but I need to turn it off you're going it's it no 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 it doesn't transmit and as you say people don't fully understand the technology they're dealing with often selling as well which is more worrying well the now I, I'm going to keep it on the remote ID theme and we're going to bounce it across to, to Richard really now because once we've got our remote ID in, what we would really need is some cheeky, clever little way that when a whole bundle of other, other paperwork's hitting the floor, we need, to, uh, we need to slide in the fines that might become automatic and autom – well, this is my understanding of it, Richard, and, and might almost be based on remote ID um, machinations. And that's just happened in the UK, I think. Yeah, that's right. So we've just seen a, an, an amendment to the air navigation order. Uh, it's taken out 94 and 95 as we know it, but replaced it with other articles. And with respect to open, specific and certified categories, you've got to produce documentation or whatever it is as they prescribed. And if you don't, um, then it's, it's, uh, it's fines on summary conviction. And summary conviction is uh, a fine that's issued in the magistrate's court. Uh, and doesn't go to the Crown Court, but if you want to appeal something in the magistrate's court, you then have to appeal in the Crown Court. But what it does do, it gives the authorities the right to fine anybody. And I think they, there are limitations on the fines. So there are five levels. Uh, number five is unlimited. Uh, but number four is up to two and a half grand, for example. And one of those is... Uh, you know, if you don't produce the documentation, then you are you could be liable up to a fine of two and a half grand. I mean, and, and that's on summary conviction. There is, and there, there, there are no defences written in the legislation at all that I can see. Hey, just, just, just to explain that, I don't understand what you mean. There's no defences. So, I, I, if I wanted to defend, so what's the is the low? The, I think the lowest fine is like two hundred pounds or something, isn't it? Like that, yeah. So, if 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 I was really miffed, I did have it all, but it wasn't in my car or for whatever reason there was. I was wrong, wrongfully collared. It would cost me too much time and money to bother to defend that. Is that am I going the right way? Essentially, Gary. I mean, it, it really, it really will depend on how harsh they're going to levy these fines to start with, and it, it's it's going to be a really interesting piece here because what what we're talking about is if 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 the CAA, CAA or an authorized person. And this is where this is where I was getting to because I couldn't find a definition of authorized person unless somebody has. They were talking about you know. traffic orders at one point, Richard. Authorized, remember when we go back in the very early legislation? Yeah, I mean it could be anybody. You know, similar to the UK counter unmanned strategy, where they're getting going to have um, authorized people to to deal with that issue as well. So you know, who who are those people going to be, and how are they going to levy the fines? But Quite often, Gary, in, in law, you'll have sometimes prescribed defences, you know, whatever that may be. You know, it could be that, um, you know, if it, it, you know, will be absolutely prescribed what a defence could be. And this is why we have case law, because say I get a fine, you know, because I haven't kept my records up to date uh, and the CAA tell me of that and, they then prosecute me, goes to the DPP or goes straight to summary conviction, the magistrate's court. I then get a summons from the magistrate's court and that, that summons tells me I've been fined under the air navigation order uh, on summary conviction and this would be my fine. Uh, 
I then have to pay it. Or, but before you get to that point, you you either have to plead guilty or not guilty, obviously. Um, If you plead guilty, generally you get a reduction in sentence. If you plead not guilty, then you don't. And if the magistrates find you guilty, then you can get a, a summary conviction of the maximum level in that band that's being prescribed under this new legislation. So if it was a level four breach, then I'd be looking at a maximum the magistrates could impose on me of two and a half grand or unlimited if it's number five. Uh, But there are statutory limits, for example, in Scotland, outside of England and Wales. Uh, So it's going to be, and then then obviously I could offer a defence to the magistrates to say, oh, my records were up to date. It's just that it didn't save it on my computer or my computer crashed and this is the latest version I have or, you know, whatever the case may be. And it might be up to the magistrate to take that into consideration and say, okay, I'm going to reduce your fine because you've got mitigating circumstances. But that's all they will be is mitigating circumstances. Um, And you'll you'll still end up with a record for that then in 50 quid rather than 5,000 quid. Yeah. Or we can just put the chain out. Come on, I just well, send them all to jail, lawless hang them. Come on, uh, it's uh, these this, this type, types of fines and and penalties, m- money penalties, is just a, a way to disens- take take away the the hobbyists from from the the game, because uh, hobbyists will look at the fine and say, oh, I, I better not risk it. Or then you just go rogue, uh, completely rogue, and like someone over there, not you, Michael, the other guy, <laughs> you just go completely rogue, and you get a, a bunch of hoodlums li- like that guy. So, But even if you go rogue, Louis, yeah. and you're caught without having flown in accordance with the open specific or certified category, you, you're you guilty and you will be I've, fine. I've just spotted something, Richard. I, I'd, I hadn't missed this, but it was stacked up in my inbox from the CAA to get oh, to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I'm just reading a point on this, and that point is in the specific category. Now, pretty much all model aviation falls under specific because it can't comply with open because it's not part of the class system. It, yeah. It's outside it. Yeah, anything this, that's not open is automatically chucked into, yeah, into specific. It's specific. Yeah. Now, this is saying you can only fly in specific if you hold an authorization or yeah. permission from a club. That means you have to join a club now to fly model aviation. Yeah, potentially. And, and they also talk about the the uh, luck, the, the light unmanned certificate. Yeah. Um, and that's that comes through all of the legislation. But I thought in, in, in CAP 722, they weren't going to go down that route. The CA weren't just going to entertain that, but it's in there and they've kept it in. And that's because it's in the what's known as the implementing regulation of the EU. Now, the implementing regulation simply means that every country has to adopt it so that every country in the EU has harmonized laws. We all operate under the same law. And that's where a lot of this, that's where most of the language has come from. So it's going to be quite, there's going to be some real interesting changes. And I don't think that um, the, the industry really has been properly consulted and notified by the DFT uh, as to the consequences of of all of this. And not only that, I, d- I don't think law enforcement has either. And I think that's you know, and that we're coming back to the same issues around. That we're now getting we're now getting more and more layers of regulation. I think I think I posted out something. You know, I think there are now twenty CAA publications that relate to drone regulation. I mean, it's great for people like me who are lawyers, and I'm, you know, <laughs> you know, people need to understand what it all means. But you know, but for the hobbyist, um, you know, or, or or even PFCO holders now, I mean, we're now bringing in EU regulation. We're now bringing in fines. Um, you know, we're now talking about the drone bill coming in as well, and it's just more and more regulation. And when you when you know. When you look at some of the commentators on this platform who talk extensively about the lack of regulation in Canada as a comparator, <laughs> you, you know, you, 
where, where do we find the, the middle ground here? Where do we get to a point where we're reasonably happy? Um, yeah, we don't have to take. Why do we need middle ground? Why do you, why do you need middle ground? Why don't you take the lowest ground? It's working. This this you know like yeah, if it works, ground, don't yeah. complicate it. Why do we take? <laughs> You know, to adopt another phrase, no, no GA below 2K, maybe that's the middle ground. <laughs> hey, ding, 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 we have a winner. Well, the, I'm, I'm surprised in um, in America more people aren't jumping up and down about, this will sound like a silly thing, but always with these things, the devil is in the detail. Removing the word uh, model aircraft uh, from the FAA's language. Now, people think, Oh, well, so what? They've removed the word model aircraft. It's no, no, you clowns. They've moved you. Sorry. <laughs> they've moved you completely into the um, into the, the UAS sphere. That's what they've done with that. But no one seems to care. I, well, I it's funny. I, ha I have a rent in the can that I'll be publishing later on today and basically highlighting the reasons for all this. The reasons are very clear why the, the hobby is just being dismantled. It's because nobody in the hobby actually stood up and said, no, these people well, work for us. Yeah. They're funded by the tax dollars. They are employees. They're there to work for us, not just boss us around. But no, everyone said, oh, you will register. I said, don't register. Everyone said, I oh, will register. It's like, it's just $5 a year or, or you know, nine quid or whatever it is. It, it's fine. But now they've got your names and addresses and now they know where to come and get you. And, and if you give them an inch, they take a mile. And this, this was so predictable right from the get-go that once they saw what a walkover the community was, they thought, we don't have to worry about them anymore. Even in the USA, a nation of 300 million people, how many objected to the NPR? 50,000. It's it's such a tiny, tiny number that it's inconsequential and it's I, we're I going to be bulldozed. What's missing in the USA is, okay, so, you know, and this goes way back. Uh, let's go back to, you know, the early 2000s. Um, since, you know, I've been dealing with the AMA here in the United States, I mean, they there goes back to 1992. The FAA said, hey, you know, I, we think we got a bring these uh, modelists under some sort of control or whatever. And then sleeping dogs went away until 9-11. Um, you know, there was a hearing in Congress and the leadership of AMA was over there. And uh, they said, hey, you know, we're thinking we got to, you know, regulate the hobby thing. And they basically just said, we do not even want to talk about it. We're out. See you later. And that was their, their um, stance on the deal. And then you move into the ARC, which we had here, and Rich Hansen was on the ARC. And, uh, you know, Rich Hansen, I mean, I was there. Artie Williams, air traffic organization, came out. She said, if you're not flying on a hobby field, you're not a hobbyist, which, you know, being the wallflower that I am, I go, <laughs> <laughs> it, what have we been doing here for the last eight months, man? You know, we've been working on this uh, supposedly community-based bullshit. It, it was a whole category bad. called park flyer, right? Yeah, no, it was all about okay. Look, you know, but the deal was is AMA has been constantly cutting deals with the FAA, and I tried to give mm -hmm. them a wide berth, but they have been constantly cutting deals with the FAA. So they're like the blessed CBO, and you have to join that CBO. And um, you know, you guys want to go down the rabbit hole? I can. I mean, it got so bad that they actually were over there telling, pe telling people in the office that we're going to be ready. We got to hire people. We got to get ready for a million members because we're going to become the FAA designated CBO. So those greedy bastards sold their membership out, sold the unaffiliated uh, hobbyist out, which I, you know, even on the ARC, I'm like, you, the AMA tried to say there was only 5,000 non-affiliated hobbyists in the United States in 2008. And I said, that's total bullshit, man. Go on RC groups. There's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, and they're not looking for flight test over a million. Exactly, and uh, they're like, "We're going with the AMA number." Thank you. The AMA even had this idea with the, you know, we had four groups of, of drones in the fifty-five pounds. Uh, and I forget what. Anyway, Scan Eagle. Huh. They um, they but who came up with the, who who came up with the numbers for those, Patrick? How were those those bins <sighs> magically derived? How did that work? Can you remember? Um, well, it wasn't it wasn't supposed to be on existing products, but uh, oh my god, it was it was it was so bad. I, I got on the call. I'm on the. Uh, it's website. not. It was the air environment. It exactly fitted the air environment platforms. I don't that know why. Two, <laughs> two kilos, which I was like, yes. did we switch over to the metric system over here last night? Yes. Yeah. So um, anyway, and then AMA even had this idea where they were going to be. Uh, 
testing, you would be able to test scan eagles at, at, at the AMA fields. And I'm like, are you crazy? What if, yes. what, you know, the scan eagle comes off the reservation and like, you know, flies into town or whatever? Your organization is done. Anyway, um, the, the stupidest thing I've heard uh, was when we're going to exempt by regulation, regulating the hobbyist. I'm, I was like, what? This is crazy talk. So the, the, where we are now, they were tipped off on the Section 3036 thing. They were tipped off that, you know, the AMA or the FA was gun in form or whatever. No, we have a deal worked out, blah, blah, blah. So the last I heard, I, I did some, uh, I did an article and I talked about Jim Williams. And then, you know, Jim Williams emails me and, you know, oh, I'm trying to help the AMA out with their problems. And does everybody remember Jim? Jim, Jim, Jim Williams at XFAA for those that. Uh, UASI, yeah. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, oh, well, I go, you know, I don't know if I'm happy about this. It depends. Are you doing this pro bono or are you charging them to fix the problem you helped create? And I didn't get an email back. So you can deduce whatever you want out of that. But uh, basically what I see there is a, is a repeated sellout uh, to become you know, uh, this, this group that you have to join. And I have to tell you too, that the BMFA, uh, you know, early on, I used to spend a lot of time in Europe, you know, a lot of people are talking about EU. I, I'm talking back 2009, 10, uh, things like that. And I thought the response from the BMFA, uh, uh, you know, and what was going to happen to the hobby was like, they were like, well, you know, we, we really don't have the wherewithal money, people, whatever to, let's say stand up an effective defense. So we got to work with them. I That's think, no, I think I, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I mm -hmm. think what happened, what happened was, I think with both the FAN, well, Richard's ex CAA barrister. So, but uh, I think the CAA and the BMFA were getting on very nicely, playing very nicely. I think things are moving along and I think politics got involved. I think the politicians have jumped in and rearranged tables and chairs for everybody. That's my opinion, but uh, well, I, yeah, I think that in part that's that's pretty bang on, Gary. I mean, it, the, you know, both parties there certainly took a collaborative approach to trying to make it work and, and respect each party's interests. And it, I think, it, I mean, I can't speak for the BMFA, but certainly, I think they thought that maybe their strategy was, I should put it like that, that a seat at the table is better than no seat at the table. At least if we can get some form of influence, then that's better than no influence. Well, it didn't work out so good for the Indians here in the United States. You know, it's the same. I, I didn't see any fire in the belly uh, from, you know, my, my dealings with BMFA. I will say well, that... The well the, well, the LMA, the Large Model Aircraft Association, who issue in the UK, they've for years they've had a sort of an airworthiness certificate for the large model aircraft. I'm probably speaking out of turn as to what that what that actually is, but you you do have to get it inspected if it's over. Uh, pull a number out of the air, fifteen kilos or something like that. That is pulling a number out of the air. Um, and they they were originally asked by the CAA, hey, when these drone things come along, don't you want to be the people that are going to oversee this? And they respectfully said, no, it's not really in our, our purview. We, 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 we don't need to do that. So, you know, there's been lots of, I, I will defend them a little bit. Maybe I'm defending them too much, but I think they've tried. Although, having said that, old Simon, uh, Simon Dale's got the best uh, concessions I think so far out of the. I'm reading uh, it right now, Gary. It's funny you say that. I have it open in front of me, and yeah, they do. I, I, I can see it. It's emanating. It's I can see it's, it's reflecting off your hat. So it's reflecting off your hat. Um, yeah. So they, they, they've, Dave, he's done a pretty, pretty good deal. Um, but it's everywhere across the world. It's a mess, and as I say, the devil is in the detail, and it's the odd word changed here, the odd word changed there, and that has a cumulative meaning um we patrick and i we have been banging the drum to a very small audience for a very long time and no one's listened but they'll start they're starting to listen now <laughs> but it's just a shame it's just a it, shame it, it, it is correct i've just read through basically in the uk unless you're a member of either the bmfma or fpv uk or the scottish one it'll be illegal to fly any model aircraft you must be a member wow. because to fly in specific, you must have an operational authorization. 
and that's what that document that FPV UK and the BFA that's have. That's the document. It's an operational authorization which allows you to fly within the bounds of that. So any normal model aircraft can't comply with the open category. It has to be in specific. And to fly in specific, you either must have a PFCO or whatever it will be, uh, author, or, author, operational authorization, and this or this, this other operational authorization. Yes, it's also no, I mean, specific, specific to that flight, isn't it? Yes. Well, yeah. no, it's not. You can fly other places as well. So so what it says is, it, and, and actually, interestingly, FPV UK have the same as the BMF, me. Um, they've all got the same. It's the same document. I've just double-checked yeah. it. And yeah. it includes any model aircraft, any control line model aircraft, any round-the-pole model aircraft. So it's not <laughs> specific. <the> pole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All of, uh, round the pole. Uh, round the pole, is that like you control? Or? Uh, no, no. It's in the Arctic Circle. circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just flying the Arctic Circle. That's around the poles. But hey, is, uh, is there, does the 250 gram weight limit exempt you from that, or is that just only for registration? The 250, that's not part of this. 250 for registration. Okay, so that's even a child's point. toy is covered by this at Christmas yeah. if they fly it in their backyard. But a, child can't the... fly it. but a child can't fly it because the yeah. minimum age for the UAS operator is 18 and the minimum age for the pilot is 10 years old. Uh, so they have to be over 10 years old. And so kids' toys are now a criminal offence to fly your kids' toy in the backyard as of next month. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The age limit, something. But, but yeah. the age limit is going to plummet. The DFT and the CA have said once the YASA stuff changes in the new year, they want to lower that 10-year-old age. I don't buy yeah, that. Regardless, because regardless of age, it. though, if they're not a member of a model organisation, it's still a criminal offence, isn't it? And, and the... Well, yes. Yes. If it flies, yes. It, if it's not got a C marking on it, so if it gets a C marking, it'll be legal. But if it doesn't get a C marking, it has to fall under specific and they have to comply with this. So they have criminalised the kind of activities that you and I did as a child completely safely and happily in our own backyards with their little toy planes. They've criminalised that. Well, when I was flying in my Barbie drone when I was a little one, um, I never thought I'd see the day that I had to register. No. Um, uh, as for locations, so it is either at any established model cup or yeah. any suitable area which is not a built up area as defined in the section 7.1. Um, and you so, can actually fly in a built up area, but you have to do a risk assessment. So, so let me, the, the seat at the table, the seat at the table concept that we were talking about, that the, the only people that really uh, benefited from that, as far as I'm concerned, are people that are getting paid at these associations. Um, that does not look to me like there was an effective ad, advocacy. And the other thing I, I did want to go back and say, uh, there used to be people at CEA or CAAs that were pragmatic, like you, uh, there was that Mr. Whitaker and uh, Mr. Dobson at the CAA UK, who were actually... Uh, you know, you could actually talk to them and discuss things and, oh, that's an interesting, yeah, okay, you know, and they would talk or whatever. What I see now is uh, from CAAs around the world is kind of the shine on, um, you know, we got it, don't worry, we know what we're doing, and then we wind up with stuff like this. I, I, it's it, to, As far as I'm concerned, it's, so, it's such a sad day. So many kids Wait. are going to miss out on, uh, you know, aeronautics. The thing is, the UK regulations are complete bullshit, and that's the problem, because we've gone into this saying we're following europe which we're leaving in under a week and we right? know why Just a, and and we've already said we're going to go our own way so we've on block accepted yeah. their regulation and then we stole their code is what we've done we've downloaded their code we've stole it and then what we're going to do is put our own name across the top of it this reminds me of something michael it really <laughs> does it's it, it they've put their own name across the top of it and then they're going to tweak it afterwards and that's why i don't believe anything they say about we're going to change it later why why not change it now before it's published because it's a piece of paper that isn't in law yet Australia's getting some pretty from is it the twenty first of January? Sometime next beginning next year, Australia's getting a whole host of new uh fines and regs and all that sort of thing as well, isn't that? Yeah. Uh, everything has to be registered. If you're operating on a commercial presence, you've got to be registered. Mm, but I think I think uh, I mean that's per aircraft, isn't it, if I remember rightly, or have they managed to move that out of the way? I would need to conf 
confirm that. I'm not I think that stood sure. to be. If it if that remained as it was going to be, that was going to start costing the average model flyer a shed load of money um, because it was going to be each aircraft. Um, we as as a I see we are, we're supposed to, we're supposed to be representing the commercial drone industry here, aren't we? And saying get out of the way, model flyers, get out of us, guy. Uh, so we're doing this wrong. Uh, it's, uh, but it's I, yeah, just, no, that's it's it's that's so it's such it's such a shame. I mean, it's such a shame. Uh, so much has been done in the in the hobby world uh, to to uh, advance air. I mean, all of air air environment stuff. Everything. Everything's been done. Scan mm. Eagle, all of the systems, all of the, you know, Pioneer and Shadow and, uh, you know, Reaper mm. and Predator. I mean, they all have their, you know, uh, roots in hobby aviation, man. And uh, they, I don't know about you guys, your countries, but everybody, oh, STEM, STEAM, STEM, STEAM. And it's synonymous with learning to code. Uh, and I don't mm. think we can all code because we have to have some vessel to put our code in. Um, yeah, just that, that's really sad. I can code. I well, can't code. I, the um, well, you know, I, I, I supposedly teach um, Steam, and uh, but I won't use model aircraft, it's too hard. I use rovers, oh. <laughs> it's just too hard, it's just too too difficult, um, to even start start going down that route which is such a shame because i'd love to just fly model airplanes all day it'd be great <laughs> it'd be really well, really really I mean, good I, I, everybody i'm sure remembers the magic of you know something you built you know and then you're like yeah you know, you know and there's this magic that you're defying physics to crap you glued together and sniffed all that glue it wasn't just uh recreational it was you know what i'm saying so uh, it's too bad. Uh, it really is too bad. And uh, but I do think that this whole thing is going to get uh, a lot worse before it gets better. And there is no advocacy. Um, nobody really cares. They think they're carving out their little thing. But one other point I want to make about the hobby thing is here. Yeah, in the there is a margin of advocacy, Patrick. Um, see, so one of the things that I've been doing here is uh, writing to members of the House of Lords on our drone bill that's going through Parliament at the moment. And uh, it's a, it's what's known as that as being at the report stage. So there's a number of stages by which legislation gets discussed through Parliament in the House of Lords before it goes to the House of Commons. And um, one of the members of the House of Lords that I've been in dialogue with has, has, has carved out an exception for commercial operations. Uh, he's proposed that to the Department of Transport to comment on. So there is some advocacy you're right, though. There, there should be so much more, in my humble opinion. Um, we yeah. could be doing a lot more as an industry group and body. I mean, I know there are industry group and bodies out there. But I think on both sides of the fence, whether it's on the government or the regulator and the industry body, there is always a capability where it's needed. And I think that's part of the problem. You, you know, you've got a real... A real uh, you know, real mishmash of capability that isn't always mixing together at the right levels. And, and consequently, we don't get consistent or, you know, well-reasoned and thought-out results. And I think that's part of the issue. I don't but, think we're going to get that here. And, and, you know, the one other thing I want to say about the, the, the model industry here in the United States, which is which is like they, they facilitated their own demise, is there used to be a lot of manufacturers in the United States that made parts, pieces, components, hardware, whatever else for the model hobby, model industry. And uh, those people are all pretty much out of business and gone. Even the hobby shops here are just like, Phew. so there's really no base to um, get money from except for uh, the AMA. And what's happening here in the United States is, is most of these organizations that are like advocacy groups are basically, uh, money generating machines and the people that are uh, in leadership roles are making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year. And the hobbyist is getting, um, you know, they're paying for it all the folly with their freedom. Uh, and then even the, the professional groups here, nobody, there's there's no uh, advocacy. And I, and I, I, I Richard, you know, I, I applaud your your efforts. But even here we had the Taylor case uh, that struck down the registration for the hobby thing. 
There was no, uh, there was no support from the AMA. They totally were quiet, did nothing, did not give any money. Uh, you know, I don't know where you're getting your Richard fund, uh, or your funding, Richard. But you know, there's there's uh, overhead with uh, dealing with all these this nonsense, filings and whatever else that you have to do, travel, whatever else. Nobody supported um, Taylor. They would not come forward and support him. I, I think we did, Gary. But you know, we're, we don't like money. We don't well, we don't like money around here. Uh, we don't. We're, it's a little rice, but you know, the thing is with that is it's so, you know, you don't have anybody, um, their grassroots advocacy does work in most democracies. You can make it work. Um, but usually even the people that are doing the grassroots stuff have their own ax to grind or whatever. So there's no, um, concerted effort. And then we have the Chinese toy company. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I love DJI. They make great products, great price point, all the rest of that way too much control. Uh, making rules and laws for the NASA. But but they've been banned. They've been banned. They've been banned. No, 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 they've been banned. Totally banned, man. It's a ban. They're totally banned. Well, they didn't get banned, but I will say that... No, you know, what I'm, no. What the I'm other hearing, thing told me they've been banned. No, and what I've been hearing... Well, they spent a lot of money to get themselves taken out of the NDAA, which is the National Defense thing. Uh, they spent a lot of money lobbying both uh, state and federal... They actually were offering to give uh, law enforcement and other entities free product if they would give them glowing reviews, write testimonials on how unsafe the United States will be without DJI drones. I mean, it goes on and on, but they uh, have too much control as far as I'm concerned. Now, they're not going to be banned, but I have been hearing uh, already that uh, states and municipalities are saying we're not going to buy any more DJI drones we're looking but it but it but is it not is it not that it's just a well i've said and people have got a bit annoyed me on lovely linkedin hello people on linkedin where people get annoyed with me a lot um that doing? well that it's just another itar is a nail in the coffin and i am astonished that people now that say that they are oh thought leaders drone thought leaders say what's what's itar <laughs> How can you put that in your in your bio? Well, you know, the ITAR was well, it was the biggest handbrake on the American industry yeah. that there could be, and that allowed China to rise and and European companies. Well, yeah. and, and uh, the true. commercial ban, the commercial ban also uh, you can't have a ten year prohibition on a technology and think you're going to stay out on front. Just not happening. But you know the commerce thing. I did want to talk about that. So the FTC. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission and everyone's you've been hearing about these drones, the American USA drones. Well, uh, they came out and they said, hey, look, you can't say made in the USA because your stuff's not made in the USA. It's actually made in other countries and you put it over here and you assemble it and then you're trying to say uh, uh, made in the USA and that's not really true. Uh, you know, the alternatives uh, that we have to DJI are really expensive. I think personally, the DJI has just handled this whole spying thing so poorly that they made their own bed with this. You can't, you can't go to a country, I think you're going to do business, go full frontal on the, the presidential administration and think that they're, they're not going to retaliate. This is not going to happen. So. Well, there, there's an element of that, but then there's also an element of the U.S. yet again shooting itself in the foot by not allowing U.S. companies to export bits because it'll it'll go more than DJI. It'll go more than, and you, you're never going to again. People are shouting as I say. I don't think I don't personally believe you'll ever see uh, an American-made uh, shop on a, a drone on equivalent to a Best Buy shop in Europe or India or China or wherever. It'll, it'll never happen. And you have to get to that point to be a really successful drone company. It's got to be on yeah. a supermarket shelf. Well, even, you know, so even, even the Skydio thing, I mean, there was a webinar today. I got a call from a guy and he told me about the $2,500 version of the Skydio and all of the neat stuff that you see is subscription based. And he's like, every year I'm oh, supposed is to buy it so yeah, for $1,500 if I wanted to do the Zoom and, you know, all of the really? things. Really? Yeah. And, and uh, oh. Oh. see, I wouldn't know these things because uh, I didn't get a review unit or a, uh, you know, anybody to even return my email. I, we can't go too hard on, uh, on them because no, I don't but, know for sure. 
but that's, that's, that's they've yeah, kept that under their hats if that's the case yeah. No, no, it's fairly the, the software. So if you want to use their imaging software, which comes as part of that package for doing all of the 3D imaging, it's extra. It's all a part okay. of the subscription. You know, you can buy the S2 and fly it, and it's fine. But if you want all of that integration with drone deploy and all of that, it's hand over the money. You know, it, That's it really very is. clever. That's very clever. Just oh, something you said cool. earlier about, it was just something you said earlier about the, the DJI thing. The, the one thing I laughed is th this could potentially hurt America more than it hurts DJI. It will. You know, this was threatened. So. Oh, this was threatened six months ago. So they would have secured their supply chain if they had any sense over six months ago. There There's a no reason they've been moving away from free, no free. Over here. Well, No, uh, but, but they do our, use our a lot of... Our administration is not known for making sense or, or having sense. It doesn't even no, but it, uh, it's been over here for years. I mean, nobody yeah. is going to spend $90 on a brushless motor, you know, and buy a no. fourth. No way. But the, they, is, the, um, but the, but the, the U.S. military carved out exclusions uh, in, into their thing for brushless motors, speed controllers, or whatever to come from China. So even they carved out uh, exceptions, yeah. so they keep using it. There is some specific technology DJI uses. You know, TI has been their battery management supplier for a very long time. Um, I don't know in their, their latest, latest stuff, but it's like M200, that was TI. Um, Umbrella is a major supplier of the socs for the camera system yep. dj have been using that but then again this is commodity stuff that can be bought outside the us the, the, the you know they don't have to go to umbrella yes they won't be allowed to sell it to them direct and they can't knowingly sell it to them but this is all commodity parts that could be picked up through the usual supply chains across the globe yes it could affect dj's bottom line a bit but they can still get hold of this stuff there is some interesting elements if you start looking at aws servers because dji use aws servers for their flight management in the us does that now mean amazon can't do business with them on that side of things and that could open up a, a very interesting issue for them could the apps be removed off the android and apple store there's there are some elements here but financially it's a bigger problem for the us because yet again they're not able to sell them the stuff that makes money and, and that's the silly part about this whole thing. So let's yeah. push, let's brush that bit to one side, and then say, what do we think about companies that are now leveraging this as a a woe? I think we know what we're <laughs> talking about now. But it suddenly stand up a load of marketing, which is oh, oh, more fluff than stuff. Oh, before Louis has a go, are we talking about the company that invented open source drones? Is this the yes, company that that's saying yeah, they that's created the yeah. whole open source community, has taken an open source piece of software and put it behind a paywall larger than the Great Wall in Game of Thrones? <laughs> um, could be. Which could one of these? <laughs> could it, could a, it, I don't know. Yeah, our team uh, are certainly getting the boot in, let's just say, and trying to say how they are the only solution that is available. They, they, they are the only open source and, and solution that's on the market, and we should all spend our money with them. Yeah, bullshit. I would, no one, no one's going, no one's going to dare pick Sounds it up. Sounds good to me. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's all marketing, isn't it? And I, I don't know, but don't don't grown ups stand back and look at marketing and and give it some critical thinking, or do we no, just follow it? We don't. <laughs> no, we don't. No. Oh. oh my gosh! Buy Coca Cola. Even, buy even McDonald's. Love to be lied to. In fact, it's it's quite oh. the opposite. Oh, <laughs> what, what, oh, I, I will say this: I was really frustrated by a number of companies his response to this you know skydios was frankly childish and it was you know okay arterian are trying to make you know steal some business well as the iron's hot let's get in there that, that, that's fair enough we can argue all day long about truthfulness within their statement however it wasn't something else but whereas skydios was very much I, I felt it, they weighed in heavily on the political aspect of it. And that isn't the best way to do business because it's all well until something goes wrong in your kitchen and you're having to explain what you've done. 
and yeah. I mean, you, you, you could tell that that comes from experience that statement can't you yeah. what did you do in your kitchen what did you do Ian? <laughs> you could tell that right? yeah. directly from experience that yeah. My, my, yeah. my view is um, all, the, all these companies have just taken market advantage on the 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 anti-Chinese sentiment that the National Def Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, has put in place, and you know it's affected many many businesses um, in in the U.S. or that transact with the U.S. And these companies that are operating within the U U.S. borders have have just exploited that as an opportunity and. You know, for me, that is just taking market advantage. If if they are being untruthful or misrepresenting what they are doing, then there are remedies in law that can address those things. Well, they, they have been taking advantage, and it does go back. I mean, when you, you know, what is the commission considered to determine whether a product is all or virtually all made in the U.S.? I mean... Harley Davidson got uh, cracked down on. A lot of companies got cracked down on. But, um, you know, most of what we buy here in the United States is designed here and manufactured, you know, globally sourced is the way they put it. But you're still paying $400 for it or $150 for it or whatever. Um, but, that's, but, that's your, but that's your ITAR hot potato, isn't it? Because even if you have the idea in the USA, even the idea, you don't even have to make the product if the government cottons on that you've had the idea, that's subject to ITAR. Um, yeah, other, other countries have that same thing, and New Zealand is uh, is one of them. Um, you know, I know people that have done jail time for stuff that they supposedly conceptualized in New Zealand and then tried to build elsewhere. Um, it is a problem here in the United States. The ITAR thing is ridiculous. Uh, when, when you really think that we, if DJI uh, was made here, We'd have problems. Um, yeah, you would, it never, never would have sold them in the numbers. It would, would have been impossible. Well, between that and the regulatory thing, it really just doomed uh, the American drone industry. And you're never going to, you know, you're never going to have, you know, as someone said, you know, on, on the Best Buy aisle be something that's comparable to DJI at the price point and the capabilities because we have laws here. You can't work people um, six or seven days a week, 16 hours a day. Uh, you know, overtime is not mandatory. Um, you know, there's environmental laws. We have environmental laws here in California that choke a, a mule. You just, you know, you can't, you just can't go willy nilly. And in a developing economy like China's, you know, you have um, cheap labor, you have different laws, you have investment from the PRC. That's another one with DJI. You know, they got money, they got tons of money. Um, mm. And even here in the United States, you know, we've been talking, oh, you know, we're going to get the SBIR and $100,000 and we're going to do it. You know, you're not going to com compete uh, with a, a company that's, you know, gotten $1.6 billion in funding. Good luck with that. Um, and we're over here horsing around with uh, type certifications and Part 135 and, and the rest of the stuff that's not scalable, which people think they're going to carve out this niche and get rich. So that, that's why I think we have the fractured um, advocacy part of this thing, too. Yeah, yeah. I've realized, I haven't said hello to Nicola. Hello, Nicola. Where's your plane? Found it off top of the mountain yet? Or is he just, no, he is moving, yeah. <laughs> nah, yeah, it's still up there. Oh, good. Very good. No chance, He's, yeah. You can, you, can sleep, you can sleep well tonight knowing it's still up there, cozy. <laughs> <laughs> You you could lie to us one week, Nicola, and just tell us you. <laughs> well, well, you could make yeah, up a fantastic story. Yeah, but then I'll have to story. show it, and uh, no, no you just get some, <laughs> get some Google Map it. Google Map it. Draw a little plane as little dots and go. He's there. Well, just, there. just bring a load of just go at one of the kit boxes you've got, crunch it up, and say, "Look, here's a bag of bits from it." We wouldn't know any mm -hmm. different. Nicola, it's a hundred thousand view video. Get it done. Finding Nicola, it, it's gonna, it, it'll change your channel forever. You need to make the video. Right. Okay. <laughs> you you sound so me. Almost convinced me there. Well, it's good to see you anyway on this just before Christmas special. Yeah. I just, uh, I completely blanked out about this, so that's why uh, I'm late. 
we we just thoroughly expect it. Thoroughly expect it these days, Nick. So it is fine. It's all good. Um, and Tom, yeah. I, I must ask Tom uh, about gliders. Tell tell me more about gliders. Still flying gliders, Tom? Or is I it am. wrong time of year? Yeah, it's it's not as fun this time of year. It's it's cold outside, but uh, yeah, gliders are still a thing. Yeah, doing soaring, autonomous soaring. Um, so we're coming out with a new product here that should be better than what we got. So we're we'll be made in that pretty soon. That's a is it, crop is it bigger, bigger or faster or it's higher? It's bigger by like longer. five ten percent. It's like it's very, basically the same size, uh, but it's uh, yeah perpetual, so n n never landing kind of plane. Three hundred ninety nine feet, or you guys? No, no. Um, if you uh, there's a picture of it uh, on our website. Uh, at least the old version of it. Um, old, old generation at cross and Donnie or cross aerospace.com. You can look up our, our gliders. So, yeah, yeah Gary had a, a little show and tell uh, stream when we did the, uh, the 12 hour flight and we did uh, 20,000 feet and a couple, a couple of cool flights with it. Mm. It's, it's cool flying around like all day and landing and you still got a full battery. And that's, that's always nice. So, you're probably ending up probably very soon you're going to be ending up more ending up writing more systems and procedures for crew handovers and what to do in a day than actually and um, when you're monitoring the thing than actually flying the airplane if you will there's probably more crm involved in that than yeah than it, becomes, it becomes a logistics um where the whole point of, the, of our product is is kind of high high flying uh, sensor node or um signals intelligence or that sort of thing just kind of, you know aircraft up high it's not doing mapping or anything but you can have a camera on it or just communications relays essentially is, is the biggest market on it and uh doing those and doing relays of those right so you have like super long field uh, long range um which is good for boats uh, throughout the ocean they uh, they don't necessarily want to rely on satcoms or they, they have a lower latency if they do it just terrestrially but a couple hops back to mainland kind of thing um, but but then the crewing of that aircraft. I mean, that's that's well, yeah. So the crewing, uh, uh, yeah, I was getting to that. Um, the, the crewing part is uh, uh, having one aircraft is nice, but it, it becomes more powerful when you have many of them, and they're like swarmy, but not in the usual sense because they're like miles apart, kind of thing. So um, it's you have a fleet of them, so that that can cover swaths of huge areas, and they can take. Them. So it's it's more of a, a multi aircraft, and um, so th those logistics with that, of course. And it, yeah, so deflecting and will, altitude issues and all that. Will you be aiming to get above flight level six uh, six zero? I think they're making a bid for, but certainly six six zero. Um, I don't know. Um, so that's that's altitudes like that are what we're aiming for on the on the on the next generation aircraft. So uh, I'm not sure. What, we haven't actually gone that high yet on the new one. So well, I should say we haven't tried to go that high yet. So we'll just have to see. Um, it's, it's just it's just a very interesting space. Sorry, I'm, I'm butting on you. It's a very interesting space. We've had the battle for the first 400 feet, and now here comes a battle for flight level 600 and above. Uh, there's UTMs vying for that, and, uh, yeah. and, and nobody used to care. It used to be U2, SR-71, and Concord. That was it. It was the only people there. Yeah. Now I'm thinking that as well, Gary, at the moment, um, replicating some of the studies that I'm doing on my PhD Cranfield and replicating that into 60,000 because not only are you going to have lots more haps, you're going to have those kind of gliders, you're going to have supersonic, you're going to have all of these kind of different aircraft in that airspace that can't be monitored really by anybody at the moment, uh, which is going to be really, really interesting because how are you going to deconflict any of that traffic at that, at that altitude? And it's, it's a really interesting space. And I think some of the lessons that we're learning at sub 400 can ap absolutely be manipulated into that airspace too. Yeah. Sorry and, to yeah. On, but... and, and even Amazon had a kind of a, a, a decent try at that when they uh, try to deconflict for their uh, traffic at the 400 type altitude where they're doing drone deliveries where different altitudes were split uh, much more higher resolution, like 50 feet or 100 feet, and there are different directions. Mm. Um, so that was a, an effort to kind of deconflict, um, you know, by, by design. But as you get higher, then you could be at sixty thousand or sixty-five thousand, and it's not that much of a difference. So it's a lot easier to deconflict and that sort of thing. Um, um, you know, mm. de 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 deconflict on accident, essentially. Yeah, I think that airspace goes from sixty thousand to three hundred and seventy-five 
before you're actually Does it now? I think. So it's something like that. Well, it's 375, that's the Carmen line. Is that what it is? I, I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the same thing as like 100 kilometers. Um, but that's yeah. not 375 feet, yeah. Um, but they, they must have moved the, 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 they must have moved around stuff. Uh, everyone's controlled airspace used to finish at flight level 660. They must have made, there must be some recent changes in law to. The, uh, the FAA have come out and said that it's their airspace is class G. By the, by the way, the reason I know the 375 number is because on Starship uh, One from uh, before Virgin Galactic, uh, that their their call uh, they're, they're in their um, their tail numbers was like in 375K something. Oh uh, yeah, plane spotter. We've, yeah. we've outed it. Plane spotter. Yeah yeah. There we are. He's <laughs> outed. Tell us about the trains next. Um, you don't. That's not such a big thing in America, is it? England's very, very well known for spotting train, train numbers. The, the trains have numbers. The carriages oh. have numbers. Uh, yeah, buses yeah. have numbers. It's, oh, that way. it's huge, huge. They don't get out much over there. No, no, no. Uh, this one was significant though, because they were trying to do the uh, the X Prize yeah, to go yeah. to the you know the Carmen yeah, yeah. space yeah, yeah. call letters yeah, yeah. or the other not the call letters. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's 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 pretty interesting that that's, that that has been declared up there. Um, so yeah, but game on. <laughs> People yeah. will be carving out ways of making money in that space now. Then that yeah, they so, never will. So this is something new, as, as or the, the sixty thousand to three seventy five. That hey, I, I don't think it is new, Tom. Um, I think it's I think it's been around a while. It's just that nobody's ever formalized it really because nobody's had the ability to get up there, and it's. It's now we're we're getting to that point where conceptually people are saying we can get up there, and some people have obviously um, got some prototypes that can fly in that airspace, and it's just working out well what happens when it becomes a bit more congested, because there are countries on the planet that can fly in that airspace, and they're all very interesting countries who you know also want to be first to the well first to monopolize the moon as well as anything else so or, yeah plant your flag yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if you have a new uh class like is it gonna be class h for high oh, <laughs> yeah but well, yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah who knows who knows but um that's what that's what it is at the moment and you know, the, the faa has certainly been quite proponents uh of that airspace and uh, I, 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 I wonder which UTM have been telling them they really need to crack on with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder, I wonder how that, how could the FAA consider that all of a sudden? I wonder, I wonder, I just wonder. Uh, I can't yeah. stand all this skullduggery that's going on. I want to be able to fly my haps with no restrictions. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what's funny is um, if, if you actually are up at that altitude and you are a relatively small aircraft, no one's going to know you're there. Like, there's just no way. Like, just like radar, just not going to see you. Radar doesn't work. It doesn't stuff. work. Like, yeah, just, no, no. just never know. This is where I think, you know, large, large aircraft that can stay up for 24 plus hours, you know, that are solar powered will actually be the relay that you're talking about already, you know, in terms of low level airspace. Yeah. But that will be the I relay. Know, I know we are. Yeah, that would be the relay back down to maybe 30,000 or, or whatever. You know, it's, the limitation is obviously going to be on comms until comms sorts itself out. Right. This might pull up a sandbag story. This is we used to have to receive uh, briefings uh, from the U2 guys, and they came and briefed us all, whatever the later one was. And uh, we used to have to give them uh, avoiding action because they were a primary radar contact up to a certain altitude. And we used to have to give it, we could only, they, we, they weren't allowed to say how high they were. So they were a primary radar contact. So you'd have, you have traffic in your five o'clock range, whatever, avoiding action, turn left. And when the bloke come and briefed us, he says, you know, when you do that to us and you tell us those things, we can't actually, they were in orbits over England. We can't actually see England down the side of the cockpit sides. <laughs> that high. We can't actually see England. <laughs> so, um, but they, they're, 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 they are handled. Uh, they might not be anymore with modern stuff, but they are handled like a Cessna 152 <laughs> flying around in the airspace. But And we don't know how high they are. Um, and they, there was points where they disappeared from radar because they're above, <laughs> you know, they're above yeah. the... The, the arc of the thing so yeah everyone just thought they could poodle around and not be noticed up there i think it's terrible <laughs> yeah no that yeah 
Anyway, I'm on my high horse, aren't I? I'm definitely on my high horse. Right. What other stories have we seen? We've already gone an hour and a half. Any, what other stories have we missed so far? Drone oh. closes Christchurch Airport. Did it? <laughs> a drone was spotted. Yeah, a drone was spotted three kilometers from the airport by a pilot, so they shut down the airport. When are they going to? Meanwhile, so hundreds away. of birds were spotted on the runway threshold, and they didn't care at all. What's going but, on with the world? But it has to be there because you're about the only country in the world that's operating normally. So it has to be yeah. there where normal drone uh, spotting pops up again. It has to be. Yes, exactly. We've got more to fear from the COVIDs than from the drones. Yes. yes. You know, a long yes. time ago, I, I was talking to the FAA guys uh, one time about a um, uh, potential accident, and they, were, they weren't concerned about the aircraft or the size of the aircraft. All they wanted to know was, how big is your battery? And the density mm. and the weight of the battery. They, yeah. they, they, they don't really care about the motors and all of that. It was just like, tell us all about your battery that you had. Yeah. Battery in VA. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> we, we did mention it earlier. So, Gary, where do you think this US thing will end up then with DJI? Because it's there's a, there's two there's two talks on this, isn't there? There's it's all going to end horribly, and they they they're gone. Or where do you think it'll end? I think I think they'll just carry on. They can still sell their gear into there. There's no no big change. Um, but there's well, somebody unless another country stands up a product that that will be on a shelf all around the world, uh, so that you can build your company around it. I I don't think they're going anywhere too fast. Love them or loathe them, you know they've a good good bit of kit. It's, that's the bottom line, isn't it? I don't know. Someone else. I think they just need to uh, re rework their their image, um, mm. and not, not be so hostile. Uh, and I think that they could kind of work their way back in. And I, I don't think they're going anywhere because nobody can really touch them. And no, most people not. here that have a drones as a servicio business are using DJI drones. Mm. You know. Yeah, there's, there's too many people using it. I mean, it's a good product. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I can't. I, I'm actually kind of surprised that something like this was so um, overreaching with it, and it feels more like a, a like a Trump move for power kind of thing. Um, it, it at the end of yeah, you know, you know, I I put a video and commented, and I did. It felt more like the last move in a game of chess before the game was put away, and I think it's more a name on a sheet of paper that is well known yeah. than actually because of anything else, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think they've been wanting them on this list for, well, we've certainly known about it for at least yeah. six months. Uh, and, and uh, it's been longer. I'm not, I'm not sh so sure that is the case. And I think you've got to be very, any, anyone that uses human rights uh, abuses as, as, as your reasoning has got to be very, what's the, don't throw stones in greenhouses or whatever the phrase Glass is. Houses, yeah. Glass houses. You've got to be, You'll be very careful of what, of what you say. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, and personally, I think it just, it just gives the American industry more, more, more problems than it, than it solves in some the, ways. The funny thing is, it's not like there isn't U.S. product. You know, Free Fry have some outstanding pieces of kit. You know, that they're, they're Subject making... To more, ITAR. Uh, subject, subject to ITAR. Subject to ITAR. You have Skydio, who have some nice... Subject to ITAR. And they can't make them quick enough. And, you know, so it it's not like... There, there isn't options out there. Um, you know, we might see Skydio in Europe this year. There's talk of it. There was whispers. They have to get on top of their current production yet. That that's, And I think they should have done that by now. Actually, that's something I need to check back in with them on because they said they were going to get on top of it by December. But if that's the case, then possibly is it Europe next? But how many people... Maybe you're waiting for the CE marking piece before they do that. <sighs> well, well, what have you, you know said? They've put a time scale on that now, haven't they? They've actually put a time. No. Yeah, I read there's yeah, a time scale. It was two now. years. It was two years. Two wasn't years. It? So, but the standard isn't ratified until the 31st of January for the C well, classification. I just had a quick look when you were mentioning about toys. You know, like those silver lit things that you see everywhere in toy shops. Yeah. They have a CE marking on them. Which CE marking do they need? Because they have oh, one yeah. for being a toy. So, which Is one do they need? And that not the China that. export one. Jeez, no. and, and that's going to be the problem, isn't it? You're going to have your lovely police officer come around and say, is that drone registered? And you're going to go, yes. And, the, and then he says, is it got a C mark? Well, it says C there. 
is that the right one? Is that for the radio? You know, and it's that's you know that's a rabbit hole we've been down. What before. happens if you write CE on it yourself? Just another another hand. Another sandbag story here is a chap that come from the come from the to a chap I know in Joba came to do his inspection from the Civil Aviation Authority, and on his Phantom he said there's no there's no emergency exit because he literally had a checklist for an airplane. So the bloke wrote emergency exit on the side of a Phantom. And they had an emergency <laughs> exit then, didn't it? You know, so they threw it on the battery hatch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Hey, here's yeah. the new market, Gary. Our next money-making scheme: C1 badges. Selling C1 stickers across Europe, people can stick them on their current drones, and they're now compliant. There we yeah. go. Yeah, and no one would have a clue. No, no one. It, it's it will be a massive money spinner. Make it like a little holographic one, so it looks like really pro. You know, like it looks really. Stick it on your aircraft, like the Intel one. C1 inside. If we put C1, C1 inside, inside. There we go. There we go. <laughs> right, we are definitely descending into nonsense. Has anyone else seen any other stories this week before we go? Any show and tell? No show and tell from the crowd? All right, well, in that case, it must leave me to say uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. Wear a mask, wash your hands, stay away from other folks. Uh, have a lovely, lovely, lovely time uh, this Christmas, wherever you are in the world. I hope it's safe and happy and all those other good things. And uh, well, I'll see you again with Daily News, and we'll see you again next week. Take care, everybody. Look after yourselves. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you, Michael, for bringing us Mission Planner Year yes. Number 10. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. We, forgive you. we forgive you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs>